Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Sarah Sanbar, and I'm one of the Ath Fellows here. The media has the potential to keep the powerful in check by making their actions transparent, exposing malpractice, and protecting public interests. In an ideal world, the media would be free, fair, unbiased, and decentralized. Unsurprisingly, that's often not the case, as we see in China. The elite in society often fear the power of the media, and so attempt to oppress, censor, hinder, and even imprison journalists who attempt to counter the party line. Nevertheless, there are those, both foreign and local, who have dedicated themselves to covering China in the pursuit of a free press. Joining us tonight is Andrew Jacobs, a journalist who has spent eight years reporting in China from, for the New York Times. His career began with contributing to coverage of the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989 and began working for the New York Times in 1995. In 2002 and 2009, he was part of a team of reporters who won a Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the September 11 attacks and reporting related to the Elliott Spitzer prostitution scandal. A man of many talents, Mr. Jacobs has also directed and produced Four Seasons Lodge, a feature-length doc feature -length documentary about a group of elderly Jewish Holocaust survivors. Mr. Jacobs' talk is co-sponsored by CMC's Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies. And as always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Jacobs. Thank you for the introduction, and um, thank you for having me here. Um, it's really an honor, and I, I wanted to give a shout out to Professor Pei um, uh, for inviting me here, and also just say he's, an, he's been a, a huge influence. Uh, his wisdom and kind of knowledge of China has had a big impact on my reporting uh, through the years, and so I just want to acknowledge him and, and thank him for this jacket, which he gave me because I forgot to bring mine. Um, <laughs> And I'm amazed that it fits me. Um, so I, um, I was, you know, as I sort of prepare for this uh, talking to you guys, I was thinking back um, on my kind of relationship to China, and I realized it's really long. It's 30 years uh, that I sort of had a connection to this, this country, uh, which I, I can't believe how old I am. But I, I um, so... My, my connection to China really began with my sister, who was four years older than me, and she was an exchange student uh, with Duke University in, in China back in the, in the, I think it was in 1980 or 81, one of the first uh, foreign exchange students in China after the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and she really kind of got me interested in China. When I went to NYU, I studied Mandarin for a year, and then uh, my junior year I took off, I just sort of, uh, fled school for a year and decided to travel around China and uh, I, oh, sorry, Asia. Uh, and, and during that trip, I ended up in China for four months. Uh, and that was a pretty amazing uh, time. It was not that long after the Cultural cult Revolution. And for those of you who don't know much about Chinese history, it was a pretty devastating uh, time of chaos and um, being closed off from the outside world. And it only ended in uh, 1976 when Mao died. Uh, so it was a pretty uh, fascinating time to be there. Um, people quite poor, but really open and welcoming and very curious about foreigners. And I kind of got hooked on China at that moment and went back to you know, finish school. And when I graduated, went back to China again uh, to become an English teacher in a city called, uh, do I need to lean over like this? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, and I was an English teacher there in 1988 and 89. And Wuhan, for those who don't know, it is a, uh, a, an industrial city, it's sort of kind of the, China, the Chicago of China, sort of dead center in the, in the, in the middle of uh, China. And uh, during, if any of you know about uh, Chinese history, 1988, 89, that's when the, the student protests uh, flared up in uh, cities across China, uh, but pretty, pretty much the biggest one was in Beijing, in Tiananmen Square. And that was a pretty um, pivotal moment, both for uh, China and for me. And uh, it was, a, it was a, um, you know, a very heady experience to be in Tiananmen Square. I had traveled there to sort of check it out. Um, you know, tens of thousands of students who were, you know, demanding uh, you know, f 
free, more, more free expression, an end to corruption, democracy, um, and very, very hopeful, kind of idealistic uh, time for them. Uh, of course, it ended uh, badly. Um, the army uh, decided to crack down on uh, those protests, and a lot of you know, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people were killed um, in Beijing. And in my city, in Wuhan, uh, there wasn't really, um, as far as I know, any violence. Um, but my students were, were also swept up in this movement. Um, and uh, I, had, uh, I had gone back to the US for my sister's wedding, and I came back with uh, the full collection of American news magazines, Newsweek, Time, US News World Report. And uh, on the cover of all those magazines uh, were images of these, these protests. This was in late May. Um, and I brought them back to, to my school, and the students sort of would hold them up in the, in the front of the protest, uh, you know, these marches that they would go up and down uh, through the city, and it was a real kind of uh, rallying cry for them, just sort of a, a, this moment where they, they realized the rest of the world was kind of watching um, what they were doing. Because up until, you know, at that point, there was no CNN there, there was no, uh, and there was really no connection to the outside world. Um, and so if you, you know, and, and, and of course it, it ended badly uh, uh, for them as well. And it was a time, it was a very, it was a very difficult time uh, for young Chinese people. Uh, you know, there was, it was still, the country was still kind of strictly state uh, controlled economy. At, at my university, it's called Hubei University, it was a teacher's college. And uh, most of the students, uh, the jobs would be determined by the, the the government. They would decide where they would teach, and if you had a, a good connections, if your family had connections, political connections, you might get a job in the city. And if you had bad connections, you'd end up in some rural backwater. And you, you know, and needless to say, the pay was dismal. Um, people were quite poor. So there was a, people were really there was there was no hope for your future. And so those protests really brought out the hope, and then they were quashed. Uh, in the ensuing years, um, you know, China suffered a, a bit politically. Uh, the U.S. and the West sort of imposed sanctions uh, because of, the, of, of how the government dealt with those demonstrations. Um, and sort of China was in the wilderness for a while. And, but by the end of the 90s, um, the things were changed and the U.S. realized the Chinese, you know, we couldn't shun China forever. Then there was that billion person market. Uh, and there was this idea that if we engage China, um, we're better off. And uh, if, we, if, if the, the things improve economically, there's a middle class, people will demand the kind of freedoms that we, we associate with sort of Western liberal democracy. Um, so if you fast forward now, 2008, I really had nothing to do with China in the, all those years. Uh, and then just sort of as a fluke um, in 2008 when China was preparing for the Olympics. Uh, I got a, uh, I was asked to go back there just for a, um, a few months really, just to cover the games. Uh, but when I got there, there was a lot more going on. Uh, there, were the, there was rioting in Tibet um, and there was a lot of other issues going on. So just, just by luck, um, someone had left around that time and I ended up getting the job full time. So it was meant to really be just a short stint and I ended up staying um, for almost eight years. And I returned to find a really, just a vastly different China. I mean, re I just did not recognize Beijing, for example. I mean, the, the, the economic kind of liberalization that followed uh, after Mao died really did work. Um, you know, up until that point, you didn't, there were no, you know, farmers couldn't sell their, their produce on the market. There were no, there were very few restaurants. And that, you know, that had sort of started to change in the 80s. But really, by the time I returned to China, it was a full-blown market economy in many ways. Um, and Beijing was transformed. A lot of the old kind of ancient neighborhoods were replaced by skyscrapers. Um, and a lot of my st former students um, who at that time or back in the day were very frustrated and uh, pessimistic had done pretty well. Uh, some of them, you know, one of my friends uh, be worked for a financial company and he drove around a, la a land uh, Range Rover. He had a suburban house that looked like it like had been helicoptered in from New Jersey. He, um, another friend who was like a starving artist type, 
became pretty successful and he uh, was getting tens of thousands of dollars for his art. You know, Chinese art was suddenly really hot. Um, so I, I, I came back in 2008 and it, was a, it felt like a, a really special moment uh, in order to get the Olympics, uh, China won the, the, uh, the bid in 2001, and as part of the deal, um, they had promised to, to, to do a number of things, uh, make it easier for foreign journalists, for example. Before that time, if you wanted to go report outside of Beijing, you had to get uh, permission from the police, you had to apply, and sometimes you got it, sometimes you didn't, and if you did, you would, you would get be, have an escort the whole time, and it just was pretty lousy. Uh, so they, they abolished that rule, which was great. Um, they, were, they promised to ease up on some uh, internet restrictions, uh, and they promised to uh, allow protests, which was a huge thing. Um, and uh, the other thing that was, that was really amazing was the internet, and that was, uh, people really felt like that was going to change things. There were countless blogs you could read, people just just going off on, on criticizing the government and a lot of freewheeling um, really discussion. Um, uh, YouTube, uh, you could get YouTube, you get the New York Times, you could read uh, you could read pretty much anything you wanted on the internet. Um, later you had Facebook, uh, Twitter. So there was a, there was a real sense that um, maybe things would would change. I mean, obviously, there was a, there was plenty of repression, um, but I think those that those first few months, uh, people hoped the Olympics would would change things, um, and you know the idea was like, well, the internet's going to really challenge these you know crusty old Communist Party leaders. You know, they 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 won't withstand this kind of onslaught. Um, so, you know, P.S., it didn't work out that way. As we all know, they kind of, they, 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 these crusty old leaders figured out a way to control the internet. Um, and as for kind of, um, I just want to show, I'll just show a few little things here on, as I talk. Um, the, uh, those, those protest zones actually turned out to be a mirage. They set up, uh, three zones for people to protest, but in order to protest, you had to apply for a permit uh, from the police, but when you went to apply for the permit, you were detained. So you never actually got out of the police station to, to organize your protest. Um, and then not longer after I arrived, um, uh, there was a, this huge earthquake in Sichuan, and that was, um, you know, over 70,000 people died. And I went down there, and um, it was a real, um, it was a really shocking, uh, both because of uh, the loss of life and it was just a natural disaster, but because so many of the people who died were students, uh, young children, who were in schools that were, you know, very poorly built. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the, you'd have the, 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 the schools were for wealthy people, the private schools, and they were standing, and then a few blocks away you'd have the, the sort of the poorly, you know, the school for ordinary people, and that had collapsed. And a lot of the schools, a lot of the buildings were fine, it was the schools that collapsed. And I think what was really uh, shocking to me was that the parents uh, were experiencing so much loss, um, and they were, of course, un very unhappy that their children were in these schools that uh, collapsed. And when they went to try to protest um, and get some, some sense of some justice, um, they too were detained. And that was, I think, a real, um, um, an inflection point um, when we kind of realized that maybe things were not uh, how we imagined. When I say we, I'm really talking a lot of Western, uh, Western reporters and analysts. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if Chinese themselves felt as optimistic. I mean, I think, I feel like often we are more optimistic. Um, so, um, so, you know, the, the China's attitude towards foreign journalists is quite complicated. Um, in some ways, they appreciate us being there to tell the China story, the, the, the China miracle story, you know, the story of, of 600 million uh, people being, you know, lifting, being lifted or coming out of poverty in the last few years. Um, and they want that story told, but the, on the other hand, they really don't uh, appreciate the, the stories that we most often do, which are, you know, critical, 
uh, negative stories. And um, that creates a lot of tension and uh, it, can, it can be quite unpleasant for us. Um, some of you may have uh, been here when David Robosa, my colleague, uh, was here last year talking about his personal experience uh, kind of uh, getting hounded by the authorities. Uh, I didn't have it as bad as that. Uh, the sort of ordinary, there was a sort of an ordinary daily surveillance that was um, pretty innocuous. Um, you know, your cell phone, you, you realize your cell phone was monitored and just like when you're, you know, you're on Google Maps and there's that little, the dot where you're, you are, I mean, they see that same dot so they know everywhere you go. Um, my email account was hacked at some point, uh, my Yahoo account, and I don't ever use Yahoo. Um, and um, uh, just sort of reporting, uh, reporting in general on anything sensitive required a tangling with the authorities. If you went out to a small town, uh, you'd invariably be met by a, a lo local police who would uh, sort of trail you. Um, and the, the, the worst kind of, it, it never got too bad, but uh, during one story, um, some of you may have heard of this blind uh, lawyer named Chung Wan Chung, who's, who's, who sort of uh, blew up on the news a few years ago after he escaped uh, from house arrest and made his way into the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, created sort of a diplomatic incident, and uh, Hillary Clinton, who happened to be there at the time, uh, held, had to intervene, and in the end he was allowed to uh, leave. Uh, so I one day, um, one of the most bizarre kind of reporting experiences I had was uh, this lawyer, Chung Wan Chung, had been in jail for uh, I think four years, four and a half years, because he was uh, trying to uh, advocate on behalf of women who had been subjected to forced abortions and sterilization in China, and uh, he was pretty effective. He, at one point, he was sort of a bit of a national hero, but the local government was not happy about it, and they eventually got him, they jailed him on very dubious charges. And when he finished his sentence, um, he should have been free, but instead he ended up uh, uh, being uh, subjected to very draconian kind of house arrest, him and his wife and his kid, um, and they basically enlisted all these local uh, residents. They paid them to uh, sort of guard the town, guard the roads in there. And they were plain clothes, and people who had tr reportedly tried to visit them had not gotten through. So I decided to try. And I'm just going to show you this very, very amateur video that I made. This was back in the Times, was, was trying to do a little more kind of a video by uh, reporters. So it just sort of shows you what, uh, what, you, what I kind of encountered when I uh, tried to go to his town. Oh. I think there's no sound though. Something I should be doing for the sound or is that mm -hmm. hopeless? Okay. Yeah, I hit the, the volume thing. It's, all, it's fine when I unplug it. I hear it through my laptop, but then when I... Oh, yes, you're so smart. Human rights groups said a couple right. was badly Shall beaten. Shall I start again, folks? All right. This is Andrew Jacobs from the New York Times. I'm here in Shandong province uh, attempting to visit Chen Guangcheng, who is a prominent rights lawyer who just recently emerged from four and a half years of, of jail and is subjected to very draconian and house arrest, uh, guarded by as many as two dozen men at any one time, bright lights at night on the house, uh, cell phone service cut off, um, and uh, is also under house with his family, his wife, and his child. We know this because Mr. Chen, who happens to be blind, managed to record a video that he had smuggled out of his house. Uh, 
Human rights groups say the couple was badly beaten after the video became public. The Chinese word for Chen Guancheng's predicament is Ruanjin. It literally means soft prohibition. Here in Yunnan County, Mr. Chen waged a legal campaign against abuses of China's one-child policy, including forced abortions and sterilizations. When we got to town, this man tried to stop us hundreds of yards from Mr. Chen's house. His weapon may seem flimsy, but he had called for backup before he started swatting at us. Those men piled out of a van and detained us. The men were part of a non-uniform security detail, keeping Mr. Chen and his family quiet through brute force. Mr. Chen is not alone. Chinese authorities are cracking down on rights lawyers, democracy activists, and underground church leaders, anyone who refuses to bend to its will. They forced their way into the car, dragged us out, um, took all our cameras, um, uh, roughed us up a little bit, uh, removed uh, chips, uh, deleted all our photos and images, and uh, after keeping our, our phones for a bit, uh, we got them back, and then uh, now we're on our way. Later, we even tried to file a report but the officer was more interested in taking down information from our press ID cards than reporting details of the incident. We did appear to get an escort, though, one out of town, by a car whose license plates had been covered over with paper. Um, so, I, I don't want to make you think that that was the kind of uh, experience that Uh, that that was not uh, a commonplace occurrence uh, for me. Um, in fact, the, the the way the government really exerted pressure on us was less direct, and often through our um, our research assistants, our staff, our Chinese staff were quite vulnerable. Um, we've had staff that uh, one researcher who has spent uh, three years in jail uh, for just for really flimsy reasons for helping us out. And I, uh, my own assistant was detained um, overnight and we've had other, uh, other, a lot of harassment. Mostly the, 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 the kind of pressure is, it shows itself through um, a lot of monitoring. They have to go to have tea uh, with um, public security agents uh, and they ask them to, you know, to talk about what we're working on. Uh, the other way is, um, they try to recruit spies through our interns. I was telling a class about this a bit today, um, how some of our interns, uh, Chinese students, were asked to be spies, and when they refused, they were forced to, to, to give up the internship. And that was a pretty uh, disheartening thing to see, because these were kids who really wanted these internships, and after just a few days, um, they were forced to quit. And you know, for all I know, some of them may have agreed to do sp some spying on us. Uh, we never knew. But to be honest, there was really nothing to learn from spying because everything we were doing, all they had to do was um, look at the New York Times in a few days and they could read all about it. So it was kind of a, a, a bizarre um, a tactic that really it was counterproductive. And a lot of what uh, is done, uh, in a lot of the attempts to kind of control foreign journals is counterproductive. It doesn't really do anything helpful for the government. In fact, it just makes articles um, more kind of anti-government because, um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do a, a, a sort of a, a very neutral story, uh, for example, on a, a town that is, you know, uh, maybe has opened a, a new museum um, and maybe you're, you're trying to walk around town and talk to people and then you f suddenly find these police trailing you and then maybe they ask you to come into the police station and they make you sit there for three hours and ask you questions. At the end of the day, your story becomes about the, the, the harassment and not about the new museum. And so that sort of ends up producing journalism that isn't really in China's best interest. Um, and so finally, um, the, the, the one tactic they tried uh, was denying of visas. Um, and so some of you may know, uh, when if you heard David Raboza speak here, um, he wrote a story about a Chinese leader, the, t uh, the former prime minister, Wen Jiabao. Uh, it was about how his family had become fabulously wealthy, um, just basically trading on their 
Wen Jiabao's position. Uh, it didn't suggest that Wen Jiabao, the prime minister, was himself corrupt or even rich. It just said that his wife and his son had become billionaires um, through their connections to their, their, their dad and their, their husband. That Anyway, that story really um, angered the, the government. Uh, and then soon thereafter, we ran another article uh, about Xi Jinping, the current president, about his family, some of his relatives, not so direct, but um, siblings, uh, also becoming super wealthy. Uh, and that uh, really crossed a line for the government, uh, and they really went on the rampage against us and um, said we were no longer going to get any visas. And the problem with that is that when I, I was meant to leave around that time, that was um, 2013, 2012, 2013, I was meant to, to go back to the U.S., but if I left, then there were, no one would be able to replace me. So it became, a, you know, and it, they were pretty explicit about what they wanted, which is they wanted, they did not want us, to, they wanted us to promise them we wouldn't do any more articles about uh, Chinese leaders and their families' wealth. And we couldn't do that. And they didn't quite understand, and I think in some ways they don't, the, 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 the American and the Western media, you could say, is that this sort of this notion that we are truly independent, that we're not controlled by anyone. And it was, that was really illustrated to me, uh, you know, I was frequently called into the foreign ministry, often to be scolded after a certain story ran that they were unhappy with. Um, but so I was, I came in once to, uh, to talk about this sort of visa issue, and uh, one of these, you know, pretty senior officials said to me, uh, you know, told me, asked for this assurance that we could we, pro you know, promise them there wouldn't be these kind of stories. And I said, no, you don't, you know, don't you understand? We could never do that. It would ruin, you know, it's sort of against our principles, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, that's, that's not true. That's, you know, the New York Times um, doesn't, is not, not, that's not how it works. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you can't write, you can't write articles about how the Jews control the media in America. I was like, uh, okay, all right, so we really don't have a, a, a common understanding here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, in the end, um, we got our visas. It took a few years, but uh, kind of politics, uh, their domestic politics trumped uh, this kind of need to, to control us because Xi Jinping, the, the new president, was going to Washington uh, first to visit Obama. This was last year. And suddenly they decided they didn't want this issue on the, the, the list of all the other kind of um, irritants in the relationship that were, um, you know, they were afraid would be brought up, and so they just thought, let's get rid of this one off the list. So they 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 gave us a visa, and I left. But I would, <clears throat> but I I think, um, you know, sort of turning back to sort of what it was like to be a reporter there. I mean, it was an amazing experience, you know, life changing, and I do feel like I had a real impact on. Um, sort of the, the, the debate about China and also on sort of individual kinds of, uh, you know, smaller issues, sometimes human rights issues. Um, but it also, uh, you can't help but be, get sucked into uh, some of the news events. I mean, you're, you're meant to be, you know, we're all meant to be as journalists completely objective uh, and detached, uh, but you uh, invariably, uh, do develop emotions for especially your sources. Um, and after Xi Jinping came to power, uh, so you know, during the, the, the years, the early years I was there, uh, Hu Jintao was the president, um, things were fairly repressive, but there was some space uh, for dissent. Lawyers were using Chinese courts to sort of um, advocate on behalf of clients who were just seeking ordinary justice. Um, there was there was um, Chinese version of Twitter, Weixin. Uh, people were you know sending out um, you know fairly political kinds of messages, and there was a definite um, give and take. And after Xi Jinping uh, came to power in 2012, that really changed. And um, <clears throat> and for me, you know, there was some uh, you know personal toll. Um, I did a story. Um, in um, the anniversary of um, the 20th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown, about this artist Cheng Guang, who was um, a soldier at the time of uh, that day. He was on the steps 
uh, the National Assembly with a gun pointed at the students. Uh, and you know, it was a really seminal moment in his life. And he went on to become a painter and painted a lot of works like these. This was, this was a painting he uh, did uh, not that long ago about sort of um, the aftermath, that sort of soldiers cleaning up um, the square after this, the protesters had been cleared away. And um, you know, we became quite friendly. Uh, and you know, after this, not well, actually, it was it, it was a few years later that he eventually got detained, um, and he was held for five weeks without. You know, he sort of disappeared. No one knew. No one knew what was going on, and he was eventually released. And he was pretty rattled. But the worst part was that um, the police took away all his paintings that he had, his basically entire life's work. And there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, there was just no recourse. You can't apply to anyone. You can't, uh, it's just as if it never, it never existed. Um, and then, the, you know, I, I, the even more kind of devastating to me was um, there's a acad uh, an academic named Ilam Toti, uh, you can see him here. He is an ethnic Uyghur. Uh, and uh, for those who don't know much about uh, China, there's a vast area in Western China uh, it's basically Central Asia, uh, Muslim, a Muslim sort of Turkic speaking people. Uh, they're called Uyghurs. And it's a very, very sensitive uh, subject for, for China because the Uyghurs would really don't feel like they're Chinese and they don't want to be part of China. Um, and um, there's been a lot of violence in the last few years. Um, and because of that, and the China's fear of losing a huge chunk of territory one day, because it's, it's I think it's uh, by the size of, um, almost size of Western Europe. It's a vast area. Um, and chi China has a pretty tenuous hold on it, as in addition to Tibet. Um, so this guy, Elam Toti, was really the only person, the only Uyghur you could call up in China and get sort of insight and, and analysis uh, about this very important subject. Uh, and all the foreign journalists would, would, would meet with him and talk with him. And he was a really you know, mild, well-mannered, you know, not a radical at all. He's a professor in Beijing and taught um, business, you know, taught, taught very, not super sensitive stuff, but he would speak his mind about uh, government policies in Xinjiang. And um, because of that in 2000, and uh, I think it was 2000, and uh, it was last year actually, he was arrested, he was detained. He was coming to the US to go to do a, a a visiting professor at uh, University of Indiana, and he was um, detained, and then shortly thereafter tried in secret and sentenced to life in prison. And you know that was that was a real kind of psychological blow because on one hand, the guy did what he wanted to do; he felt compelled to you know speak out on these issues uh, in a very careful way. He knew the red lines; he you know he knew what he should and shouldn't say. But it wasn't enough to kind of help him, and I, you know, you can't help but feel like you you play some small role um, by publicizing him. And I, you know, he was frequently quoted in in my um, in the stories whenever you had a, a, a Xinjiang, which is the region's called Xinjiang. If you had any kind of story about that, you'd always call him up. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it becomes very personal after a while, and and then in general, Uyghurs have a very, very tough time in Xinjiang, uh, Uyghurs and Tibetans, um, you know, as a you know, sort of daily life is, is really hard. And I have a, a, a good friend um, who's Uyghur, he's, a, he's actually a, a dancer, he's not political at all. But what's happened now in, in China, because the Uyghurs are so suspect, um, they, uh, people sort of look at them as potential terrorists or they're thieves, um, they're really not, they're really looked down upon. And this friend of mine, you know, he went to, to the southern city of Guangzhou uh, to take a job at a nightclub, a very innocuous kind of thing. Um, he could not find a place to live. He, uh, he would check into hotels and, you know, he's, he looks kind of European because the Uyghurs look quite different than the Chinese and chat up the front desk. And as soon as he, you know, they showed him his ID, uh, the national ID in China has your ethnicity on it. So they would be like, oh, 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 we have no room, sorry. Sometimes he would even be in the room asleep and they would knock at the door and say, you have to leave. We, we suddenly have a, a very important guest coming. We need your room. Um, so this happened again and again. And you know, he'd call me and you know, tell me um, 
what was happening and uh, eventually had to, he had to give up the job and come back to Beijing where things are a little more uh, liberal. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 uh, it was an intense, um, you know, time. Um, so I, I would, you know, I would kind of close by saying that I, f I, I, you know, in the early days, this, this kind of optimism that I first saw a glimmer of that optimism in, in 1980, 1989, this hope for kind of political reform, for freer media, um, you know, that I think is always just beneath the surface in China. And there, there is, you know, kind of this optimism that things will change. Um, but I think the next uh, five years, because Xi Jinping still has, uh, I think five years left on his term. Um, there's even talk, though, of him trying to extend his his tenure, uh, even though Chinese leaders are meant to only serve ten years. There's some speculation that he may try to break that rule and and sort of stay longer. But even if you even if he will only stay five years, I think um, it'll be a kind of a pretty grim time for um, for people who care about. Um, you know, le legal reform, uh, rule of law, um, you know, just free speech, justice, these kinds of issues. Um, and I, I'm still, I think I'm still ultimately a, 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 an optimist at heart. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's going to be a pretty kind of grim time um, for now. And I'm not sure that you know, there was this, this idea that we had in the West that if we just engage China and, um, you know, we, we supported them and their economy, uh, they would grow rich and people would naturally uh, want to be like us and, and emulate our system. Um, and that hasn't turned out, it hasn't turned out that way. And I think that's a real kind of um, sobering realization for a lot of uh, people, journalists and analysts and advocates, um, that uh, you know that perhaps China, the China, the Communist Party has found kind of this formula to keep themselves in power, this authoritarian model where they can have economic growth, um, but also stifle um, you know the media, the internet, um, and sort of stay in power. So um, that's kind of where I am right now. I just I'm I'm. I'm s slightly uh, optimistic, but mostly I'm sort of a pessimist on sort of the, the um, near near term um, with China. And um, I'm happy to take any questions from folks if they want to. Thank you so much for your uh, talk. So I'm primarily going to ask a question about the Uyghurs. I, last year in high school, attended a very international school, and we had kind of a very sensitive presentation about the situation of Uyghurs in China. And I mean, it's a very it's, it's a school in America, and I, it's frequented by many Han Chinese. Mm. I don't mean to like be kind of accusatory in that. And they refused to kind of acknowledge that there was any sort of plight against Uyghurs in China. But I mean, from what you tell me and from what I've studied, they're kind of relegated to the provinces and the country and they have a dearth of resources. So how does that kind of, especially Western educated Chinese, how does that disparity kind of come forth? And furthermore, I've heard there's kind of possibilities of sort of like almost affirmative action-esque protoc protocols to get Uyghurs involved in the cities. But from what I've heard, that kind of only ends up with backlash and kind of more discrimination from main Chinese to, mm. to the Uyghurs. So how do you propose uh, China solves this problem? And how do you kind of see that disparity between many Western educated, predominantly Han Chinese view of Uyghurs and the actual situation that they have in China? Thank it's a really you. good question and super complicated and wrought. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know there are, there are a lot of Han, uh, I'm assuming there are some Han Chinese in this room and I, they probably disagree with me. But um, many Chinese educated, worldly, you know, knowledgeable about the world have a very strong opinions about Tibetans and Uyghurs. I would call it a blind spot. Most of them have never been to Xinjiang. And even if they have been to Xinjiang, they don't really know what's happening with Uyghurs. 
A, because the, the domestic, the Chinese media is fully on that subject, you will not see any dissent on that. Um, it's very controlled. And if you go to Xinjiang, you're likely to not actually, m if you're Han, talk openly with a Uyghur because they would be afraid to actually talk to you openly about their lives. They, won't, they wouldn't trust you and they'd be, you know, they wouldn't tell you and they barely even tell you, me as a foreigner, it takes a lot of coaxing. Um, but I have been to Xinjiang many times and I seen firsthand, they face a lot of uh, very severe repression. Uh, religion for one, um, anyone under 18 cannot go to the mosque, there's no religious education. Um, during Ramadan, the holy month of Ramadan, government employees and even college students who are Uyghur or Muslim are forced to eat during the day. Um, they, on the flip side, there is affirmative action, and this is what a lot of Chinese will cite, that Uyghurs do get these advantages when applying to college. They get extra points um, for being Uyghur, and that is true. Um, and there is some effort to sort of promote them economically. There's been a lot of economic development in, we, in Xinjiang, money poured in, but there's a very strong divide between Han and Uyghur. All the people running the show in Xinjiang are Han. Um, there'll be a, there may be a mayor of a city who's, of, who's Uyghur, but the party boss of that city will be Han, and he's more important than the mayor. So there's a really, it's a really big divide, in, and I get this a lot, even from my friends, my Chinese friends, on every subject we will agree, but when we talk about Xinjiang or Tibet, and even Taiwan, um, we, it's really hard to see eye to eye, and I do think a lot of it is because of propaganda and this nationalist education that has started after Tiananmen. After the crackdown in Tiananmen Square, the Communist Party realized they had lost the youth, they had lost the affection of young Chinese people, and they made a concerted effort to imbue public education with a more national so patriotism. And part of that uh, has affected the way people think about certain issues. And, um, and then there's the media. And if you look at um, stories coming out about Xinjiang or Tibet, it's a lot of that, uh, look, at the, look at the great economic development, the money that's been poured in, look at the happy Uyghurs, they're, they're singing, they're dancing, um, they're very, very happy, they love the party. And it has an impact on people's thinking over time, and they do start to absorb it. Um, and, I, and, I, and many of my Chinese friends who have gone to Xinjiang, and I've told them what to do, and, and to actually spend time meeting Uyghurs and making them feel comfortable that you're not actually working for the government, and you're not going to turn them in, and you get to know them, and you will learn a lot about what their lives are like. There's a lot of fear. My friend, uh, my Uyghur friend, for example, you, it's very hard to get passports if you're Uyghur. Um, or Tibetan in China, but he got a passport, but he had, a, he had to pay for it, he had a bribe, a lot of money because he wants to study ab abroad. Um, and then starting last month, there was a directive out that all the Uyghurs had a, who had passports had to turn them into the police. Um, so he's terrified now he's gonna lose his passport. He, he didn't give it in, but he's being, they've been asking him to give it back because um, he wants to go to, he wants to study abroad. Um, same things happen to Tibetans and um, these are things you will never read about in the Chinese media, you will not read about this passport issue about the re religious restrictions. And the government will adamantly say there are no religious restrictions and they'll have articles about showing people praying. And yeah, the people, there are mosques and stuff, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's real, the, the, the repression is real. Uh, and I've, I've seen it up close. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start my question by quoting Professor Andrew Walder, who visited a few weeks ago. And he said, uh, if Mao, Mao Zedong were alive today, he would find the Chinese contemporary society a nightmare. It's a di dictator dictatorship filled with, uh, by market economy with huge wealth di discrepancy. Uh, and my question is, uh, do you think in the long term um, this combination will work? And if not, what reforms should be made by the CCP uh, without leading to his own demise? Yeah, that's a good question. I think Mao would, would not recognize China um, in, in, in a way, there's really nothing communist about China anymore. I mean, there's very little that is identifiable as communist. There's um, social welfare system is pretty negligible. I mean, there's you know, great education for basic education, healthcare, but um, there's a lot, there's a huge wealth gap in China. I mean, it's, it has one of the biggest wealth gaps in the world. Um, and you see that, um, you know, it's 
right there on the streets. I was telling you guys earlier about I've never seen more super luxury cars in my life in Beijing. I mean, the amount of Lamborghinis and Maseratis and uh, Mercedes. I mean, it's incredible the amount of wealth. And then most people really struggle, um, live on very little money. No one's hungry. People, are, you know, people definitely have enough uh, for you know a pretty decent life, but they're not really. They feel like they're not getting ahead. Um, so I would say the wealth gap is a huge problem, and um, I think the, the party realizes that. And they, you know, they, they are making some efforts. Xi Jinping has, you know, one of his mandates, or, or he's talked about, is sort of solving kind of the economic troubles. Um, but I don't know if he's if that if he's doing making any headway. Part of that is reforming the state-controlled part of the economy. A huge part of China's economy is state-run. A lot of the industries are not subject to free market. Um, forces, and that's a huge drain on um, the economy, on society, and he hasn't really tackled that. W um, I was talking to Professor Pei about this earlier, about what, you know, he's a slight, he has his timetable for sort of demise of the parties a little earlier than mine. I, I, um, I don't know. I used to think it would be 10 years, and now I don't know. I just feel like they've become so good. The parties become so good at control. They are just... The, you know, they spend more money on domestic security than on the military. I mean, their internal security is is immense. Um, so they just, they know what everyone's doing at all times. And the internet, uh, you know, like I said, like they have perfected, not perfected, but they've de nearly perfected the, the, the art of controlling the internet. It's become, it's become an intranet, not an internet, um, you know, and so, I don't know. I feel like things have to get really bad. The economy would have to crash and stay uh, in a bad shape, bad shape for a long time before people are motivated to take to the streets because people know what happens when you protest. I mean, anyone, uh, everyone knows. You cannot just, uh, you, can't, you can't go out on the street with a placard and not expect some kind of uh, penalty. So... Hi, so um, my question is, um, as you know, like recently, there's been a growing trend in China of the richer upper middle class uh, sending their children to study abroad in the US. And like, um, so do you think that once these students, uh, so um, once they absorb these sort of more democratic liberal ideals of the West and that they return to China and start to assume position in society, do you think they'll be able to play a role in kind of liberalizing Chinese society? That, thank you for asking that question, because that was actually my ending of my what I was going to say to you guys, but I forgot. Um, so I, that that is the one thing that really does give me hope, because as you guys know, there's uh, there, I think it's over 200,000 Chinese students now studying in the U.S., uh, and I think more than half of them will return. And I do think... Um, that has to have some kind of impact because these 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 people are going to get positions in hopefully companies and government and th th there must be some impact down the line. I don't think it'll be immediate, but I I do feel like over time that will help change things. Um, yeah, I mean I don't think I don't think students are willing to risk everything to sort of become politically active, because that would be a, the death of your career and your everything else. But I do think if the, when the time is right and there is some space, I think those people will play, will play an enormous role. And, and a lot of um, you know, exchange students who go back to China get involved in social um, uh, or you know, nonprofit organizations. There are lots of uh, nonprofit groups in China working on you know, poverty, education, things that are not political. Um, and those people are having an impact, and I, I saw it all the time. I saw these um, people who go back to really give. You know, some people go back and get jobs in finance, and, 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 and they want to make a lot of money, but a lot of people go back and try to do good, and there are, there are ways to do good in China. Um, you won't make any money, but you can certainly have an impact, and I think, I, think I, I do believe that over time that'll have some you know, impact. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean that China is going to become a Western-style democracy. It just means, I think, what would make a huge difference for ordinary Chinese is just have uh, more justice, more fairness, have a, a you know a, 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 a rule of law, and I don't think it's 
maybe it's not realistic to have free elections in in the next decade, but maybe it's but maybe a goal is to have a a society when you know if you get you know um, if you endure some kind of abuse, if you lose your land because some local official decided he wanted your house, that when you can get you can get some kind of justice. And right now that doesn't really exist. If you're going up against the state, you're going to always lose um, in court. So I think that would make a huge difference, and and that's not necessarily asking a lot. And I think um, you know young people are helping with that. Young people like you guys who go back, um, a lot of lawyers, a lot of judges. You know they're they're just pushing very j carefully on the edges. And I think you know co collectively maybe it'll take maybe it requires a different leader, someone who's not so draconian like um, Xi Jinping. Maybe it's the next leader. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I want to change the gear a little bit and ask you a question about the Chinese journalist. So I want to know like, what, kind of, what the opinion you have regarding the Chinese journalist and the ch chi Chinese uh, publications, especially newspapers. Do you think in the, uh, in the way that they train people, there's like a difference between the Chinese state uh, journal, uh, journals and newspapers and also uh, the foreign journals like uh, New York Times? Cause I, Previously, personally, I also knew a few New York Times journalists in China. I just feel like there's a kind of a difference that does not like this, does not exist in how they were trained and how they were educated, but also because that they have, they're, they're working at, the, at a foreign newspaper, so like they will have more freedom in, in publishing or talking about some of the issues. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about, you're talking about Chinese journalists who also work for Chinese publications, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen, it was, I think it was two years ago, Xi Jinping made some kind of c comments that Chinese, that journalism, I think it was to journalism students. Um, anyway, he said basically your job is to support the party, first and foremost. Your job is to promote and protect the party. So I think that's the message that's been given to them. Though people who decide to go into journalism um, Chinese who go to journalism, they are brave and they are idealistic and they are really want to do the right thing. And I really admire um, these people and I became friends with lots of Chinese journalists. Um, and they, it, but it's really, really hard. And th th there, was a, there was a period of time in the late 90s and up until really in, t uh, in 2012, until Xi Jinping came to power, where there was some space for Chinese publications, especially like um, these privately, uh, these new publications that were not run by the state. Um, there was some room for some investigative stories, uh, especially financial kind of related investigative stories, and they did great work. Um, but that's pretty much done. I mean, it's very hard to do anything that is perceived as uh, criticizing the government, um, and a lot of people have left the business, a lot of uh, Chinese journalists, I saw this pattern again and again, you know, because there are a lot of journalism schools in, in China, and these kids graduate and they go, they get jobs at, um, you know, Xinhua, the, the, the newswire service, China Daily, the English language, they get these jobs and they're idealistic and they really try, um, like I was saying today earlier to um, journalism class, you know, they, can, they will go out and they will report a story um, and they'll come, you know, say there's an explosion at a chemical factory, um, and it turns out that this factory was you know, I illegally producing some substance. They'll go, they'll go write their story, send it in, and then they wake up the next morning and there's nothing, there's nothing in the paper. And it turns out it's their own editor who spiked the story. So um, they're, they're doing good work. You're just not seeing it. It just gets, it just gets deleted, it just gets censored. Um, it's, the, it's, it's mostly the editors of the publications who do the censorship. They are um, worried about their own careers, about their own safety, and they know what the lines are, and, th and they err on the side of caution. So if they're not entirely sure, they'll just not run, it's it's, they prefer not to run it. And then if they do, and if a story is run, the propaganda ministry is quite all seeing and all knowing, and they, someone will read it. I had a friend who worked at this department, this sort of um, kind of censorship, you know, they'd read an article and they'd sort of pick up the phone and they'd be like, hey, um, will you remove that article now? And they're like, okay. So it's a lot of um, 
micromanaging content too. Uh, and 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 the the crazy thing is, is all these a lot of the censorship, like I'm saying, is takes place within, like so you know, China, Google doesn't exist anymore in China. They sort of left because of censorship. So what took their place is the Chinese version is Baidu, which is the, the search engine, um, and they have a huge staff of people who do censoring themselves um, the search results. So it's not so much government doing, but actually private citizens who are do preemptively doing the censorship. Um, yeah. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk, but um, I was just wondering, so for example, I spent my first eight years in China and then I moved to Canada. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm Canadian, I'm not American. But um, I find myself not really having, I am Han, ethnically Han, but I don't find myself having sort of um, like preconceptions or biases, say, against um, the situation in Xinjiang or anything. But I am wondering, however, because the education system, and even in my eight years there, I, like now that I look back on it, I mean, you did like sing the national anthem, like at this like assembly sort of thing every morning and such, but it does make me really curious when I am learning about all the issues of my own country through a very Western, um, I guess, perception. And it makes me wonder though, if this is truly the objective version of the news there, because what's actually happening there isn't really being reported or it's being censored by the actual Chinese people. So when you have a situation where the controversial issues and such are revealed or um, are revealed by, I guess, Western sources, um, I mean, is it really fair to, I guess, deem the Western view as the most objective view? And do you think there is harm in having a situation like this when the people that the, I guess, the issues and problems are affecting aren't really able to give their take on it and are therefore forced to sort of have their problems be revealed mm. by other sources. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, ideally, uh, would, would be to have a, um, a free media there that could delve into these issues. And obviously, the reporters would have a, a greater understanding, perhaps, than even we would. But I mean, I think as far as journalists, we are trained to, to write, to, to go into any situation and write about anything and as objective way as we can possible you know like we we're not perfect and there's no such thing as pure 100 percent objectivity but you strive for it in your articles and um i think we we're we're perfectly equipped to do that in xinjiang or in tibetan areas as well tibet actually we can't go to tibet is the one region that foreign journals are, are not allowed to go um nothing to see nothing wrong but you just can't go there um but you can go to Tibetan areas outside of, of Tibet, because uh, actually a lot of Tibetans live outside of Tibet uh, because of the way borders were, were drawn um, after Mao took power. Uh, they live in a lot of other provinces. So um, I, think, I think we're pretty well equipped, because it's basically you're telling the story of, of people and their lives. And um, it's not that different than going to the Bronx and writing about people struggling to, for to have a you know a cl uh, you know a better schools or you know it's they're familiar oddly familiar issues that people have anywhere in the world uh, at least to me so I think we're, I think we're able to be objective um, the other issue that comes up and we talked about this today earlier in um, uh, journalism class was um, there is a lack of balance in a lot of our stories but that's because we don't get the uh, the other side of the story from the government. Um, and I, sh I, I meant to mention this earlier, that th th we, you, you really can't get comment from the government on most stories. There's no, um, you know, in the U.S., if you want to, in Claremont, you want to call up the mayor's office and get a comment, there's probably someone who works in, in the p press office and they'll call you back in an hour. Uh, in China, there's no press, th there's no one to call. There may be a number you can call, but it'll ring and ring and no one will pick up, or if they pick up, they'll hang up, or they'll tell you to send a fax, and you'll send a fax and never hear back from them. So there's really no way to get the government side of the story. And when you go to a sm small town, same problem. You can't, you can't get anyone to talk to you. So on these very complicated issues, um, controversial, contentious issues, you don't have the government side of the story. So what you have is a, a, a pretty one-sided story about allegations from Uyghurs or from Tibetans about what their lives are like, and then you have a single sentence, um, you know, Chinese authorities declined to comment for this story or, you know, refused to 
uh, answer phone calls or whatever. So th boom, and that's all you have. So of course, when you read that article, you're like, God, this is one-sided. But what are you meant to do? What we do, all right, what we do, do is we'll, we'll, we'll go through Chinese media and we'll pick out if there was a story in, in uh, Xinhua, the, the wire service, about this issue, we can pull out a quote from that and say, you know, even though the government wouldn't, t wouldn't talk, Xinhua said this about the situation. And that, that does help. Um, but in terms of getting, asking questions and getting a give and take, no, it's, it's really, really, it's, it's rare. I once, in all the years I was there, I had one interview with the, with the police um, about kidnapped uh, children where I actually got a sit down interview with them uh, and that was the only time I think I ever had a sit down. Yeah. And it hurts. It hurts. It hurts China. It's it's not a good strategy. Hi, and um, thank you very much for coming here. Um, you addressed this a little bit in your answer to the previous question, but I want to ask another question about objectivity. Um, and so you mentioned um, at a few points in your talk about how. Um, like you uh, develop relationships with your sources and also about how the authorities would sometimes retaliate um, for negative stories. So I was just wondering like, how specifically do you try and like, pursue objectivity um, when you know that like, writing a negative story um, could have consequences for you and prevent journalism in the future potentially mm -hmm. um, or when you know that it could harm one of your sources or things like that. Yeah, it's a real conundrum because you know that by this person talking to you, they could get in trouble, but the thing is, these people want to talk to you. They insist on it, and who are you to decide? They know the repercussions. They know the potential repercussions. They are Chinese, but they are really want to get their, their story out, and so, and they can't get it out in the Chinese media, so you are their only option, and what do you do? Do you say, no, I'm not going to talk to you because it's it may endanger you? You can't, that's not, that's your, not your decision to make. Um, if they seem like they're not fully aware of the potential repercussions, you can explain to them, like in the past, people who have talked to me about the subject have gotten in trouble. Um, and sometimes you'll do that. But most people who, who talk to us, um, they're often activists or advocates or they've gotten in trouble before and they are passionate about whatever that issue is. If it's, you know, if it's some you know, chemical plant that was built illegally in their neighborhood, they don't care what could potentially happen. They want, they want to get their side of the story out. And so, um, but it, it does, sometimes it feels crappy when you, you find out a few days later that they were detained after talking to you. Um, but there's never, no one's ever expressed regret to me for that. And some, in some ways it emboldens them more and makes them more fiercely devoted to whatever cause it is. They feel the sense of righteousness and their anger builds. Um, but the, the but the, the objectivity question it's you know it's a it's an age old one and I don't know if there's any um, you know perfect answer I think you do strive for it you're conscious of it I'm very conscious of it because after every article I will get emails from uh, Chinese readers usually in the U S or Canada or England Chinese students uh, who you know who are here readings our stuff and they'll say to me oh I thought your article was quite biased and um, and they'll point out what they thought and then we'll have an exchange and I wrote I write everyone back and I've had countless um, kinds of discussions about this issue and it makes me it keeps me on my feet keeps me aware um, and so in every article I'm writing I'm, I'm really striving for that objectivity um, and trying to give even if the government doesn't talk to me, I try to get their point of view across, um, even though for a lot of American readers it can seem kind of not very sympathetic, what, why they want to do what they're doing, but it makes sense to them and it makes sense to some Chinese who, who for example, believe control um, is important, that, that, that society would become chaotic. Without these controls, China would become a chaotic country and, uh, and there's 1.3 billion people and we can't have the kind of freedoms that you have in the U.S because it would just be, it'd lead to instability. And a lot of people believe that. And so who am I to, you know, I mean, I are, are you kind of, but who am I to say that they, their point of view isn't valid? That's how, what they believe. Um, thanks for a great talk. Uh, you know, you gave us a really f fine grained sense of how the police state works, how the repressive apparatus works. And the one question I had was, 
whether this repressive police state, uh, it, how does it inculcate fear? You know, uh, it, it's a one billion uh, country people. It is very differentiated by now into different spheres of life. How does it ensure that every citizen, in a sense, is feared, and so they don't do anything because they are feared? One theory could be that it's a powerful, it's effectiveness of the, you know, of the police apparatus, that they actually are able to monitor. So the 10 people who followed you in that village, there are so many people, there are citizens who are part of the, you know, the police force. And that's an argument about the capacity of the Chinese state. But I think you also hinted at is that private citizens also participate in some kind of monitoring. So what are the various routes through which fear is inculcated and how does the repressive state work in this complex polity and economy, especially vis-a-vis -vis the local and, but you know, how does fear get inculcated? And I have a second related issue, which is that James Scott gave this very interesting idea of weapons of the weak. And his idea was that in some countries where there is authoritarian rule, peasants in his case in Vietnam used everyday forms of resistance. And in your travels, did you come across that everyday forms of resistance, which you can't rebel in an organized way, but are there other everyday forms of resistance that you, one can see? Mm, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I would say for the first question about fear, I think a lot of people are fearful. And unless they, fe unless they have a personal stake in an issue, they're not going to speak up. Most people are not going to sort of take to the streets and demand free elections because it's not really, they'd rather have a, 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 a safe, peaceful life and they want their they want to see their kids grow up and they want to see them go to good school so they're really focused on their kind of qual daily quality of life it's only when something an injustice happens that people are moved to action um, and it can happen in any class I've seen I've met countless people from poor to wealthy when something happens to them where they're 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 everything they've worked for is threatened they may, you know, may be losing their home because of um, a project that they feel is corrupt. They will speak to you um, because it's 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 worth for them. It's worth the risk because they see the foreign media as the only hope they can get for some kind of action, and it often is elusive and and doesn't work out that way. But sometimes it does. Sometimes you'll do a story. It could be about something small and the attention that it gets does convince someone to pick up the phone and say let's not do this it's going to look, look bad rare but it happens um and in terms of ordinary resistance i would say people have a very i would say ordinary chinese are very cynical about the party the communist party on one hand, they do see the party as, you know, the common view as the party. Without the Communist Party, there would be no new China. You know, Mao helped China stand on its feet, up to, you know, against foreign aggression and, and domination. That they believe. Um, and the, the party lifted 600 million people out of poverty, which I don't necessarily agree with. But that's a kind of, a, a kind of a, a, an idea that's very firmly entrenched. Beyond that, most people have a pre pretty pragmatic and realistic view of the party. They know it's, it's corrupt at every level, uh, especially local, the local level, it's very, very corrupt. Um, there's no sense of idealism about what the party does and why people join the party. You know, joining the party is only to help your career. It only, it only gives you benefits. It's not because you're trying to help humanity. Um, so in terms of resistance, um, I'd say ordinary Chinese are probably not interested in, 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 in acts of resistance. They'll try to get around. The, there is a sort of an art form in trying to get away with stuff and get around restrictions, and people are quite good at that. I'd say an ordinary resistance is internet stuff, which is fascinating um, how you can, because the way they do a lot of blocking and deleting is through words. So, you know, okay, today we're not going to allow anyone to write about um, um, Let's just say Wen Jiabao, uh, the former premier. Let's block him from 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 Twitter, the Chinese Twitter Wei, Wei Xin. Um, so what you'll do is instead of writing Wen Jiabao, you might change one character in his name that sounds like Wen, the character for his, his last name, and you change to a different character. So it will 
they won't show up with the sensors. And so that's a way that people use to get around sensors. And it's a really fascinating thing, and it's very creative. And um, our Chinese uh, speakers here can probably give better examples of, of how it's done with uh, words that sound like other words. It can be really crazy. But that, that's a very common way to get around um, the government restrictions. Um, people are pretty good at um, working the system, especially if, they, if you're in the middle class, um, certainly if you're wealthy, you've developed ways, um, you know, if you want to get your kid into a better school and a better district, you, you'll, you know, you might sort of buy a, a play or rent a place uh, there just temporarily to register your kid. And then you, once your kid's registered, you might move back to your other place. I mean, there's ways to sort of work the system. Um, and there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for sharing everything with us today. And can I just say, nice jacket. Thanks. Yeah, it's such a great <laughs> nice fit. Nice color, right? Too, yeah. um, American and Western uh, news organizations have maintained bureaus in China, in Beijing and Shanghai. AP had a, a bureau in Guangzhou for a while. Uh, Japanese news organizations have uh, bureaus in Dalian and uh, Chengdu. Do you see, has, has the Times ever thought of expanding to have a third bureau elsewhere in China, or do you see the uh, possibility of Western news organizations having news bureaus in uh, Chongqing or Chengdu or Kunming because China is so vast and uh, so much of what happens is far away from Beijing and Shanghai? I would say probably not. I feel like if it was going to happen, it would have happened in the, the last few years when there was this huge boom in interest in China. I mean, the moment there's a, there's a bit of a lull, I think, um, because China sort of dropped off. The, there, was a, there was definitely like a five-year period where China was the most important story of our time. Um, I think it kind of coincided to like with the Olympics and after that. Because, you know, in 2008, the U.S. was in the in the dumps economically, China was having double-digit double digit growth. So there was this idea that China was really um, going to take over and supplant us. So there was a lot of interest in China. Now that their, their economy has slowed, um, the ISIS has become, a, you know, the sort of terrorism, migrant crisis have become a little slightly bigger story. China's fallen back a notch. So I don't see it happening right now. I think that down the road, if, if it becomes... A, a, a bigger story, which probably will. Yeah, I don't see why not. I think a place like Chong, Chengdu or Chongqing would be a good place to have a bureau. But then again, news organizations, you know, are not in the best financial health. And it's expensive to have bureaus, and it's probably cheaper just to fly someone there when there's a story. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm not terribly optimistic about expansion of coverage in China for the moment. This will be our last question. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, you've been here five, uh, eight years, so I want you to uh, give us, uh, tell us the three most uh, encouraging trends you saw by the time you left China, and the three least encouraging trends. I think um, environmental uh, awareness uh, is has been a huge thing. I saw that happening when we first got there. I mean, China is very as usually polluted, uh, and and ordinary citizens are very aware of the air bad air, and also just sort of con chemical contamination of soil and water. And that and there has been some movement. Um, environmental organizations are the one kind of spot, one of the few spots where you can sort of advocate on behalf of that issue. Like I said, people uh, actually protest. It's the one place you see protests. Is, um, middle class Chinese will will take the streets for an environmental issue, um, like a, a you know a PX plant that's opening. Uh, you know this petroleum kind of products, um, and generally as long as they're not violent and they dis disperse after one day, they're generally okay. Maybe the ringleaders will have some problems. So that's one area. Um, animal rights. Uh, advocacy is actually the one bright spot. I mean, um, you know, up until recently, China has really had, you know, it's a pretty bad place to be a, an animal. Um, and there's been some great uh, work done by young, educated Chinese 
um, who have um, one thing they do is, you know, dog people, you know, eat dog, especially in the South. But everywhere in China, they eat dog meat. And a lot of those dogs are actually stolen dogs. Um, there's no farm. There's no dog farms. Uh, basically, the dogs are stolen off the street from people's front yards. And they truck those. They put them in trucks. And they truck them to the slaughterhouses. And what happens is these activists are on the highway driving around in their, in their new Toyota. And they see a truck with piled high with dogs. And they'll actually pull in front of the truck, block it, get onto Weixin, and put out their, to, the, to the friends and they all come out and they block the truck and they'll have these standoffs um, with these trucks and what they end up doing, the police will come and they'll end up paying for the dogs. It's like, here, we'll give you $10,000 and they'll free the dogs. And it's amazing to see. And it's very, of course, then there's a problem of what to do with all those dogs. That's a whole other issue. But um, that's, that's, you know, a, re a real bright spot. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the one-child policy has been relaxed, uh, was recently relaxed, now you can have two children. Um, I think that's a, a really good thing for China, for China, for Chinese families and for the Chinese economy, because China's going to be aging uh, pretty quickly, rapidly in the next few years. Um, so that's, that's probably good for China. Um, three things that I, uh, God, there's so many. I, I would say ethnic, um, I think ethnic relations are really at a low point right now. Um, like I mentioned, Uyghurs. Um, and, and Tibetans, I feel like they, and this is the, you know, there's very little of awareness about this in China, but among, if you're a Tibetan or you're weaker, you're really worried about the future of your, your, your culture, your heritage, you, you know, there's a sense that over time you will lose your language and, um, many of your distinguishing kind of cultural, you know, their heritage. Um, that's a, that's a, fee, uh, that's sort of, there's been a lot of erosion of that. Um, I think um, obviously l the l legal sphere, there that was a real bright spot for a while. Chinese lawyers um, being allowed to take on cases that would challenge the, the, the government obliquely, um, that's, pr that's sort of dried up. A lot of lawyers have been uh, detained, um, or some jailed, but mostly just terrified right now. So people are, you know, sort of scaled back their ambitions in, in the legal sphere. Um, and then probably, what I say, the third one is, I guess the the the, the media. I think the Chinese media has really um, in sort of reeling right now. Um, they're not sure really where to go, and in, in, in terms of how to cover important stories. And there's been a lot of, um, yeah, it's it's hard to know where that's going to go. So I guess those would be my three. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Andrew. Thanks, Thanks for having me. I love your your uh, this your college. It's beautiful. Thanks, everyone.